In the 1980s, my mother immigrated to Canada looking for a better life. And when I was a little girl, she would talk to me and she would tell me stories about when she thrifted from furniture to furnish her apartment, where she scoured coupon books to understand what she would be feeding herself with the next week because money was tight. And when I think of Groupon, I think that if Groupon had existed back then, her quality of life would have been better. And that's really the beauty of Groupon, is being able to leverage strength in numbers where profit and the interest of consumers isn't mutually exclusive. And that's really amazing. And that's what we want to help you build upon today and help you deliver that even better in the future. So that's what we're here to do. We want to help you put the customer first. And so with that in mind, my name is Catherine, and these are my colleagues, Natalie, Natalie and Jeremy. And we're so excited today to be talking about how we can help Groupon create and sustain a competitive advantage in a challenging industry. And with that in mind, we have three key considerations that we really want to walk you through today. And that's to understand how you're currently not able to completely satisfy both the needs of vendors and customers and why that's important for your business. How you can manage your unprofitable business lines and loan your business in the future, as well as what are some key resources that are the source, source of your competitive advantage that you can leverage moving forward in really learning how to compete better in this industry that's changing and growing. So moving into the first topic, you've got a really interesting business model here at Groupon. And so you've got your vendors and your customers, and they have all of these interests. So your vendors, what they really want is to make profit and really reach new customer segments through the network that you bring in all of these locales. And what your customer really wants is to be able to find deals and really improve their quality of life with the disposable income that they have, much like my mother did back in the 1980s. So with that, you want to capture that business, and that's really awesome. But right now, there's some pain points that we currently want to look at. So with your competitors, over 26% of them are losing money on these deals right now because there seems to be a misalignment in what your customers are looking for and what you're currently offering. And then with your customers currently, they're not so sure about uh, the, dis the distinct positioning that you hold or what they should come to your website for in comparison with competitors like Travelocity or other more focused groups. So what we really realize here is that in order for you to grow and sustain and succeed in this industry, you need to both increase the user base of vendors as well as customers in a focused way in order for you to create that ecosystem that we talked about that is really going to help you leverage those synergies in building your business and sustaining an advantage in this competitive industry. Now, looking at your business, a key issue that you have is that you have limited resources. But why is that? The, w one of the first reasons is that a large portion of revenue actually comes from first party sales. What does that actually mean? Well, you actually buy in the products first from wholesalers at a discount and selling them um, at a slightly, slight markup. But that also means that you have a lot of capital tied up. A lot of capital tied up in terms of cost of goods sold as well as inventory on your balance sheet. And what, it, what that also means is that your uh, profit margin is also quite depressed. You're seeing roughly 10 to 20 percent in terms of profit margins from your first party sales, whereas you're seeing 80 to 90 percent in terms of profit margins from other businesses like third party, third party sales, which currently you're not actually exploiting. But what we want to really draw your attention to is that this really affects your free cash flow. And how that actually impacts your stock price is actually deflating your stock price um, because you have a lot of um, uh, cash flow tied up in terms of, of your inventory, and that exposes you for a potential take, takeover. You've highlighted the fact that um, Alibaba currently has a 6% interest in your business. Well, that exposes you to some risk in terms of your stock price being inflated. So with that in mind, let's quickly summarize what we discussed earlier. So it's important for you to satisfy both your vendors and your customers in order to leverage the business model that you have going. But currently, with a lot of resources tied up in inventory and your first party sale, uh, the sales of your first party goods, that's putting you at risk of a uh, hostile takeover as well. So with what we want to do is help you defend your business. And in order to understand that, we want to understand how this industry competes, as well as what are some things that you can leverage moving forward. 
So in the industry currently, what you'll see is that barriers are, to entry are very low and customer search, switching costs are virtually none. As a consumer, I could shop with Groupon or I could choose to shop with any other one of your competitors depending on the good that I'm looking for. And not only that, but within the barriers to entry, it doesn't take a lot to really create this kind of business. You would need a platform, you would need some maintenance admins, some marketing costs, and maybe some personnel for customer service. And this is what really allows a lot of competitors to enter this attractive market very, very quickly. And there's really nothing that's differentiating them from one another other than their focus and their positioning as well. So all of these competitors are able to satisfy this basic requirement, but what that really means for you is you need to understand how you can compete in a way that's different from everyone else to sustain this amazing growth that you've had to become a leader. And just to mention as well, you've become a leader because you were originally a first mover in this market, but this is changing very rapidly and we need to find a way for you to just for you to really differentiate yourselves. So we want to look at your key resources, and what you really have going for you is still the remnants of that first mover advantage. Being the largest global player in the deals and coupon industry, you're able to leverage a global network, brand recognition, your relationships with your existing vendors, as well as large amounts of cash that are currently available for your use. You have over $300 million right now in cash, and that's a huge amount that's sitting around that could be invested into growing and sustaining your business. And something that we want to know about all of these things that we just mentioned is that it's valuable, rare, and imitable. And because of the size and organization of Groupon right now, you're able to leverage all of these strengths in building a competitive advantage that your competitors cannot immediately gain simply by entering into this market. So that's what we really want to leverage, is your global network and presence and the size of your organization with the resources that you have in building that competitive advantage that will allow you to compete. So this takes us into our question, how can Groupon really sustain a competitive advantage? And we recommend that you do this by focusing on three key things. The first being paring down unprofitable business lines. The second being um, focusing in on your customer base. And the third being growing out into the international space. So first, taking a look at paring down and on the unpopular uh, revenue segments. So you'll notice that within Groupon's revenues, 5% of your revenues are coming from your travel segment. However, we see this as being quite unprofitable for your business because it um, leads to confusion for your customers in terms of what you're currently offering them. So the other segments that you have in, within your business right now are local goods, first party goods, and third party goods. And those are all quite aligned in terms of their offerings. However, the travel segment can be better served by niche uh, markets such as travel agencies like Expedia. So you'll see that a lot of your customers are going towards competitors like that to serve their travel agency need. Um, and so we recommend that you remove this business segment from your line overall because it's creating a lot of confusion for your consumers. You'll be able to reallocate the funds that were allocated towards this segment into growing your other ones to make those more profitable. And overall, this will allow you to ensure that your customers have a better understanding of what your business is. And in addition to that, they'll be able to focus in on developing the other segments for you. So let me actually wind down uh, the traveling business uh, with a group on. So we're first looking at you know, the capital investment that you're putting into the business itself. And where those resources can be better um, invested, such as third party, where there's a lot more margin that you see. In terms of the execution, well, we look at your workforce, and there's a potential for you to actually divert, for example, uh, this uh, business development employees, administrators, um, into these more profitable segments, and really just grow your capacity, grow your ability to develop uh, those business, uh, business units. In terms of paying servants, well, you would like to pay off, uh, pay off several employees um, who maybe aren't on board uh, with this uh, new relocation, reallocation of resources, new construction within the business. Then lastly, training and developing those staff um, to essentially uh, grow within, for example, third party, uh, compensating them accordingly in terms of the leads that they do produce, produce in terms of partnerships. In terms of evaluation, in terms of the restructuring, we do see um, that we value for you to conduct a 360 uh, peer evaluation. What that essentially means is that you're evaluated by both your subordinates, your peers, your managers, so you get feedback from all points uh, of contact. So next, if we take a look at how you can really work on customizing the user experience, we want to help you focus in on who your consumer is. And we can do this by taking a look at John.
So if we take a look at Dawn, we'll see that she's 40 years old. She's really interested uh, into yoga and she likes food. So what your business can do for her is provide a really unique customized experience through your website. And we plan to do this by reallocating the cost savings that you save from the decline in the travel business and reallocating them in towards proprietary um, technology in order to really provide a great customized experience for her. So now when Dawn goes to your website, she'll be able to see things that are relevant to her um, as opposed to seeing just a general basis of different items that she could see. So as a foodie, she would be particularly interested in different restaurants that she prefers, and also as a yoga um, fanatic, she might be interested in different fitness packages that are offered within the local centers. Um, aside from your website, you'll also see that she'll be able to receive mobile notifications um, based off of when her favorite companies are pushing out different Groupons for her, and this will keep her up to date um, on all of your app needs, and this will also allow her to continue using your services more effectively. So before we dive into how you can really acquire those uh, AI capabilities to make those uh, make those plans a reality. What we really want to talk about is that even though you have a new platform that we're proposing, it's really important to get that out there into the hands of the, your consumers. So we just want to quickly go over some marketing costs as well. So what we did here was we assumed a simple rate of your total um, total market, total attainable market of ages 20 to 60 um, in about in your US population that checks their phones regularly for dealing with coupons and I'd be happy to walk through more of that in the Q&A. And we back that number out to make a conservative assumption that you would grow that base by 1% in the first year and then 1.5 1, 1 and then 2% in the following years after that for the next five years. So with that in mind, we backed up the marketing costs that we think it will cost you to achieve those numbers to provide you with a, he uh, with a solid ROI that would allow you to make this investment worthwhile. So we wanted to pursue three key channels, that's Facebook, Google Ads, as well as YouTube, with uh, impressions of 8.5 million, 16.5, and 4.5 million. And then we've applied the relevant conversion costs there to provide you with the total marketing cost we think it would take for you to really get that new platform into the hands of your new consumers. So the total marketing cost there would be about $595,000. So how do we actually provide that uh, customizability, customizability to our consumers? Um, well, it would be through implementing an AI. Well, we could develop that in-house, or like Google, like Amazon have been doing, they're acquiring out smaller businesses who have those capabilities, who could potentially become a threat to them. So that's what we recommend here. You see that you have a huge amount of resources on your balance sheet, roughly $800 million in cash sitting that you're not employing. And so we, were, we recommend actually taking out and building that capability by acquiring an AI business. In terms of execution, well, we would essentially incentivize that AI management to stand the company, um, train and develop that AI capability and incorporate it uh, within Groupon. Um, essentially do management rollover equity, so giving them this percentage, perhaps, so for example, um, stock of maybe 1% or to like 0.2%. Um, and, and then integrating the AI team directly into the uh, DevOps team um, so that the user interface, user experience uh, is, is cohesive. Uh, in terms of evaluation, while well, we see that um, there will be a clean role in terms of the AI capabilities uh, of Groupon. Now, providing customers with a customized shopping experience, which is really our end goal here, we'll be building up the cloud storage um, and computing capacity as well as developing uh, servers um, to really track customer buying trends, customer browsing trends, um, to really, again, offer them and provide them uh, a more personalized, more customized um, shopping experience when they do go log into Groupon. Um, and as well as to send prompts to customer accounts and page logins, so we're able to target customers more effectively uh, by implementing this AI. In terms of evaluation, what we really do want to see here is that by focusing more on, cus on customer needs and customer per uh, personalization, um, well, essentially their uh, bill size, their cart size would actually increase uh, with uh, this customization. So now moving on into long-term strategy, what we really want to help Groupon do is grow their business. And we see the best way of growing your business is to look into pursuing third-party um, sales um, globally and regionally. So currently, you have a lot of local and regional competitors. However, they don't have the same network and capabilities that your company does. 
in order to pursue the global expansion. So you'll see that there's a lot of potential for you to capture that gross margin, 75 to 85 percent um, within third-party goods. And this is huge compared to what you're currently seeing um, within your uh, first-party goods, which is roughly around 10 to 20 percent of a gross margin. So this gives you a great opportunity to grow your profits and increase your revenues. And in addition to that, you'll be able to leverage the great brand equity that Groupon has and also the network that you have built out across America. And overall, this will allow you to capitalize on those core strengths and also build a sustainable competitive advantage against those local and regional competitors. So again, looking at developing um, third-party <coughs> partnerships, like Natalie highlighted, you currently heavily, a uh, large significant portion of your business is actually coming from first party with roughly 10 to 20% uh, profit margin only. Um, going to third party, you're seeing, again, roughly 80% profit margin. So how do we actually expand and build those capabilities, build those business relationships uh, with those third uh, parties? Well, we to expand the business development team, we do recognize that there's an investment that needs to take place uh, of roughly, let's say, 10 people in terms of growing that business, contacting, making leads, um, and then, um, essentially targeting more specifically uh, food, fashion, and essentially lifestyle brands. So we're looking at Boston Pizza, Under Armour. They are global brands. Uh, they do place the products um, across the world, and you have that capability that maybe your more local um, discount websites aren't able to provide. So there's a lot of synergies there. Um, and the value proposition to these third parties is essentially that they have less points of contact. With Groupon, they're able to work with Groupon, and Groupon's able to roll it out across the world versus them having to work with separate regional um, platforms. In terms of evaluation here, um, your business has been seeing roughly 8.8% uh, return on invested capital. We like to see that this actually does increase margins because um, you're able to uh, realize those uh, increased profit margins of 80%, so ROIC would likely go up to 10 now, in terms of how, how do these costs actually factor into your business, uh, well, we took a, a free cash flow approach. Um, to walk you through our assumptions here, well, we looked at total size of the market that was given within uh, the case, and we addressed roughly 50% of that was um, applicable to uh, the 26 uh, to 50-year-old uh, market. Um, and then we backed up customer population uh, based off of that. And given 155 average uh, deal size per customer, uh, we back out potential revenue from this new third party segment. Now we do realize that with third party segment that there's potential for cannibalization of other segments of your business and we factor that in. Um, estimating roughly 10% cannibalization and cutting back revenue based off of that. And so we do come to an EBITDA based off the margin of roughly 13 to 12%. And uh, you can see our costs broken up here uh, in terms of algorithm driven developers um, to really build out that AI machine learning capabilities that's going to really give you that competitive advantage. Um, you see that that comes at roughly to 2.3 uh, to $3 million in terms of essentially developers um, and their salaries. As well as the acquisition of the AI business, building those servers, building those capabilities in your business, that's going to come at the upfront investment of roughly $200 million. Um, and then again, like Catherine uh, mentioned out for you, is our marketing cost and this is development based off of uh, the, new, the new hires that we would be making. In terms of investment, in, in terms of return, we do see that this does reflect quite favorably in terms of free cash flow uh, on your business and can be quite profitable for you. Now how does this actually break out for you in terms of the time? <coughs> well, we do see that this is a um, big change for your business. There's many moving pieces and so, uh, we would recommend taking a timed approach with it. Um, and that's broken out to you, and we're happy to walk you through that uh, in question answer period. Now, in terms of several risks that we do see in um, our, recommendation, our recommendation today is that some competitors might decide to enter and invest in, in AI, as well as what if there's lack of luster growth in terms of global partnerships in terms of third parties, we'll also have you walk you through that in Q&A. Mr. Williams, you have a great business model but we want to help you preserve that moving forward. And we're just here today to help you do that even better by leveraging your global capabilities and these vast resources. We really believe that you can maintain and grow a more defined position in this market of coupon and deals. 
And with that being said, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We're very excited about the strategy today, and we'd love to walk over more details in the question and answer period. Just a quick question here. Uh, quick presentation, but um, so you mentioned that the travel segment is a bit confusing for the customers. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of that? Like, what makes it confusing for most customers? Yeah. So just to walk you through that, um, our reasoning behind the fact that it might be confusing to customers is because a lot of the other things that your uh, company is servicing uh, focuses on products and like, goods and services um, as opposed to travel. So you'll see that within the Groupon website, you might be able to access different restaurants, events, concerts, um, in addition to consumer goods. However, we see the travel segment as being quite separate from that, and that's better served by um, companies that are specific to travel, such as travel agencies or travel websites. Right. But in terms of like a dual or triple play, does the travel segment allow synergies where you can have a package deal, like with, you know, an individual purchases a travel coupon, but then they also add on a restaurant, you know, coupon as well, plus maybe a concert in that locality as well. Does that, like, is that, if we get rid of travel altogether, are we going to lose those revenues as well? Yeah, that's a really interesting point as well. What we believe is that you should focus on your core business lines and find a distinct positioning there where there's other competitors can, who can do what you do in travel. We think that as a long-term play, it might be great to consider those partnerships where those synergies align, and that even opens up you up to the option of cross-selling with other competitors' customers rather than competing with them directly, but then that way you have the capacity as well to focus on what you're good at. Is the coupon industry on traffic or is coupon on traffic? So the industry itself, as we mentioned, has very low barriers to entry. But not only that, but what we're seeing is that the business model for every single company here is that it's very hinged on buyer power as well as supplier power. And then you've got all of these substitutes going on of other coupons, websites, the individual retailers having their own promotions. So overall, the, the industry itself is quite difficult and challenging to be in, but that doesn't mean that you as a company, especially with your resources, can't work to succeed in this industry. Do you have any plans for uh, feedback from the new uh, customers and new vendors to know we can more of it and work on it? Yeah, so currently, um, the big issue that you're just facing is that percent of your business partners are actually break even and roughly 20% are actually losing money. Um, so what we do see is that uh, a potential feedback cycle would be um, through having our business developers really engage with these business partners um, and potentially severing ties uh, with businesses that are actually being unprofitable because it's it, we're, we're spending resources um, across um, multiple partners who might be unprofitable. So having our business developers really manage that, that would be essential. Um. You mentioned acquiring a firm $200 million. Do um, you consider other alternatives of acquiring technology that would have a lower cost base, such as acquiring the rights to uh, AI rather than purchasing it? Definitely, there are considerations there when you maybe partner with an AI firm and do all of those things. But given that we really want you to preserve this as a competitive advantage for yourself in this industry, we want you to have that knowledge in house rather than partnering with someone else because that will allow you to own those capabilities and build them however you need and preserve that advantage for yourself rather than having these competitors go somewhere else as well. I didn't see in your risks um, anything regarding the human capital piece. So uh, often assessing uh, who works for us and why, uh, the costs and legalities of, of managing people in and out uh, can be complex. Any thoughts on what those risks would be or why they were so you do see that a lot of companies um, do take a look at that uh, in terms of their due diligence before they actually do go in and acquire a business. Um, cultural and organizational cultures in terms of uh, obesity is a huge issue within M&A. Um, and we do see that having that due, due diligence process prior would be uh, important. Any plans for targeting a particular segment? So the particular segment that we want to focus on is the lifestyle segment. And as we mentioned earlier, the particular age group that we're sort of looking for is around 